Let's say you have a hundred dates lined up. Maybe you've been going out a lot, being social, and the next two weeks are looking pretty good. But there's a catch to this. After each date, you have to decide whether you want to marry that person. So how it works is you go on your first date. When it's over, you can say, yes, you want to marry that person. And it's guaranteed they'll say yes, by the way. Or you can say no, and you'll never see that person again. So as you can see, there's no second chances in this scenario. Now, how would you approach this if your goal is to pick the very best person out of the hundred? And yes, there only is one best person for you. If let's say your 10th date goes really well, would you pick that person or would you say, well, I have 90 more dates to go. I'm bound to find someone even better in that time. You can take an emotional approach to this or an algorithmic one. Now, if you've read this book or you've seen my video on best books for people in math, science, or engineering, you know the right answer to this. But at least in my video, I didn't go into much depth. So let's break this down because like I said, there is a right answer. First, let's simplify the problem and say you were going to go on one date total. The odds then of picking the best person are 100% of course. I mean, yeah, they're also the worst you could say, but we're only concerned with picking the best person here. Now let's say you go on two dates. What are the odds of now picking the best person? I'll just answer this as well and say it's 50%. No huge surprise there. If you go on the first date and like them, there's still no way of knowing whether the next person will be better or worse. You have a 50-50 shot, so just take your pick. Now what about three dates? You'd think you'd have a 33% chance of picking the best person, and that's probably true if you tried this on your own. But there's an algorithm to follow such that you can pick the best person 50% of the time, and it all depends on what you do after the second date. So here's the algorithm. You go on the first date, but you will never pick that person. Then you go on the second date. And if that person is better than the first, you marry that person. If they're worse, you go on the third date and of course have to pick them. And this is fairly easy to verify. We'll call the three people you're going to go out with person one, who's the best person two is the second best and person three is the worst. But of course you don't know that beforehand then the order you go on these dates is completely random and these are the six ways it can occur. Now let's look at the first scenario. The algorithm says go on the first date. Don't pick them and then go on the second. If that second date is better, marry them. If they're worst, which is the case here, you move to the third and marry them. So in this case, you pick the worst person and the algorithm failed. In this next case, your first date is the second best person. You of course move on, and then after the second date, you pick that person because they're better than the first, and the algorithm worked in selecting the best candidate. If we do this for all scenarios, you will pick the best person for three of them out of the six, thus getting a 50% success rate. Now if you were to go on four dates, you do basically the same thing. Go on the first date, but don't pick that person. Then after the second date, you'd either marry that person if they were better than the first or move on until you find someone better or have reached the end. If you were to go on five dates, you'd make that decision of either marrying the person or moving on after your third date. As the pool of candidates keeps going up, the place to make the decision of whether to marry that person or keep looking approaches 37% of the total. As in, if you were to go on 100 dates, to optimize your odds, you'd go on 37 dates and then pick the next best person who's better than all those 37. And on top of this, if you follow the algorithm, you'll have about a 37% chance of picking the best person. Yes, that 37% does come up multiple times, but it's not random. 0.37 is about 1 over E. And that number holds no matter how high you go. As in, if you were to go on 3.5 billion dates, half the world, and followed the algorithm, you would go on about 1.3 billion dates, 37%, and then pick the next best person. And that essentially means you'd have a 37% chance of picking the best person in the world for you to marry. This is a problem in something called optimal stopping, where you can't always go back after making a decision. This could be like looking for apartments, knowing it will be taken if you say no, or looking for a parking spot and thinking there's always one that might be a little closer. And this is one kind of problem that mathematicians and computer scientists deal with all the time. Now to be fair, this is not a perfect example because how do you define who is better for you in terms of who you want to marry, but it still gets the point across. Algorithms have been around for centuries, way before computers. The word algorithm can bring up many thoughts depending on who you ask, but really they're simply a sequence of steps to solve a problem. You learned one probably in elementary school when you did long division. But there are many more out there with very practical applications that I want to go through a little. So let's just go into the next example. Which of the following would take longer? 
sorting a bookshelf of 100 books in alphabetical order, or sorting two bookshelves of 50 books each in alphabetical order? The answer is that first option would take a longer amount of time on average. The reason is because although there are the same total amount of books, in that first option there are twice as many places for each book to go. Now the next question is if you did have to sort the 100 books alphabetically, how would you do this? And really think how you would do it if you had to do it in as fast a time as possible. Here's one method you can use. You can scan the books from left to right looking for pairs that are out of order, and then switch those two. Then keep going until everything is sorted. This right here is an algorithm and it has a name which is bubble sort. It's very simple yet very inefficient. Another option would be take all the books off the bookshelf and randomly put one back. Then for the second book you put it either to the right or left of the first so that they're in order. Then just keep going until all the books are on the shelf and in order. This right here is insertion sort. It's a little better, but not by much. Now before I show you one of the best algorithms, something computer scientists care about a lot is worst case scenarios for all of these. Like using bubble sort where you're just switching two books at a time, what's the most amount of switches you'd have to do if the books were let's say completely out of order? And the second part to this is if it were to go from let's say 100 books to 200 books, how much worse does the worst case scenario get? Does it also get twice as bad or even more or maybe less? This all has to do with this big O of N notation, and the author explains it really well. Let's say you're having friends over for dinner, and the amount of friends will be N, the variable that can change. Now of course you'll need to clean the house before they get there. Whether you're having one friend over or a hundred, it's still one house that needs to be cleaned. It does not change with the number of guests that are showing up. This would be big O of 1 or constant time, where it does not depend on the variable N. Now what about the time it takes to pass a dinner plate to every single person at the table? If you have twice as many people, it will take twice as long to pass a certain dinner plate around. It varies linearly with the amount of guests, and therefore you have big O of N or linear time. Now what if every pair of guests has to shake hands? Like your first guest arrives and has to shake hands with you, then the next guest shakes your hand and that first guest, and then this continues. This would be big O of N squared or quadratic time. Then there's also exponential time and factorial time, which are awful problems for computer scientists. Factorial time would be like trying to shuffle a deck of cards into perfect order. Five cards would yield 120 possible shuffles. Double the amount of cards to 10, and it makes the issue 30,000 times worse with over 3 million possible shuffles. Now going back, bubble sort has big O of n squared time. The worst case scenario is the books or numbers or whatever are completely backwards, so you have to take n passes through n books to get n squared which is not great, but it's way better than n factorial. However, this does mean if you double the amount of books from 100 to 200, the worst case becomes four times longer to sort. And unfortunately, even though insertion sort is a little better in practice, its worst case is still the same, the big O of n squared. A way better method would be merge sort, a very famous algorithm in computer science which had a huge impact on the field and is a method of choice for large scale industrial sorting. How it works is basically if you have a stack of books, bring some friends over or you can do this yourself and divide the books evenly into smaller stacks. Then have each person sort their stack. Then everyone pairs up and merges their stacks together and you keep going until everything is sorted. You can also see that in this animation where the list of numbers is divided into smaller groups. Then they're paired up and put in order. Then different pairs of ordered groups are brought together and sorted themselves and you keep going until everything is in the order you want it to be in. The worst case for this comes out to big O of n log n, which is worse than linear time, but better than quadratic time or the bubble sort. In fact, it's been proven that the worst case scenario for fully sorting n items through direct comparisons cannot be anything less than n log n time. There's no linear time for sorting, like passing the dinner plate to every guest at a table. A famous problem related to all this is the traveling salesperson. We're given a bunch of cities, you have to find the shortest route that goes to every city and returns to the original. And this has applications in like planning a complicated route for a delivery service. One solution to this is brute force, checking every possible path, then picking the shortest one. Because it can't fail, right? But it has a worst case scenario of n factorial. So if there are 1,000 cities, even a supercomputer will not help you there. One early algorithm was found to have a worst case scenario of n squared times 2 to the n, which is at least better than n factorial. 
And there are other algorithms that can even find solutions for over a million cities to around 1% accuracy. I'm not going to go into much detail on that, but just know this is something you can expect to see in undergrad as a computer scientist. And hopefully you're also noticing something with computer science and algorithms, whether it be with optimal stopping or the traveling salesperson. It's often not about simply finding a solution that gives you the right answer. It's more about trade-offs. For example, it's like finding methods that might not be as accurate, but take a fraction of the time to run. But overall, sorting is a huge area of computer science. As Google has to sort through millions of web pages, Yelp sorts through restaurants based on various parameters, and the posts you see on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and so on are all sorted using algorithms. Sorting algorithms are something computer scientists, computer engineers, and software engineers can expect to learn in one of their first programming courses in undergrad. Then in the last few minutes of this video, I'm going to talk about a unique field called game theory and its applications. Now let's say you're playing a game of rock, paper, scissors, and you have a strategy of playing rock much more frequently. Your opponent will catch on to this eventually and start playing paper, making you lose. So now you'd have to switch strategies and start playing scissors. But the opponent will eventually catch on to this, and as you can see, you have instability, where you have to keep changing your strategy. Now the best, quote, strategy without getting psychological or anything would be to throw rock, paper, and scissors about a third of the time each in no particular order. This works because there's no benefit in deviating from your strategy, and this means that you've reached an equilibrium. But now let's look at probably the most famous game theory example. What you're going to see is a situation where you have two choices to make, and regardless of what your quote opponent does, it's always better for you to pick one of the specific choices that I'll explain soon. But when both parties pick the best strategy, it becomes worse for everyone. It seems weird, but let's see it. This is The Prisoner's Dilemma, and the book explains it slightly differently than you'd see on Wikipedia or another YouTube video, but it still works well. Imagine you and a co-conspirator have just been arrested for robbing a bank of a million dollars. You're both separated and will be interrogated without any contact with the other. Let's also note that you just met this person to rob the bank. You're not friends and you have no trust in each other or any emotional connection. Now if you both stay silent, aka admit nothing to the police, you both go away free and split the million dollars, 500,000 each. If one person stays silent and the other person rats and informs the police, the person who stayed silent gets 10 years in jail, while the person who ratted on the other goes free and gets the entire $1 million. If you both rat on each other, you split the blame and each get 5 years. Now think about what would you do. The weird thing about this is it's always in your best interest to rat on the other, no matter what. Now, when I first heard this, I had to reread it, but it does make sense. Let's say for a second the other person stays silent, but of course you don't know that. You have two options. You can stay silent as well, which means you both go free and you get to keep $500,000, or you rat on the other and you go free and keep the full million. So either way, informing the police is simply the better outcome. You go free in either scenario, but in the second case, you get $500,000 more. Now, let's say the other person does inform the police. Your options are again, stay silent, meaning you'll get 10 years in prison, or you inform the police as well, and you get five years along with the other person. Again, the best option is for you to rat on the other. Thus, you have something called a dominant strategy, where you always rat on the other person because it's always the best outcome for you. But the dilemma here is that if you both follow the best strategy and inform the police, you get five years in jail when it would have just been better to stay silent and split the 500000 Had we had some central authority like a lawyer who could talk to both of us, the outcome would have probably been better. But by playing the game so you could gain as much as possible, you actually cause harm to both parties. Now that you've seen this example of strategy and rational decision making, take the concept of traffic. Let's say you have a bunch of drivers who want to get from point A to point B and can take multiple routes. We can think of this as a game, where everyone's goal is to get to their destination as fast as possible. So if there's any path that's less crowded, it will lead to more people taking it, which can cause congestion that's actually harmful to everyone. A more algorithmic and less selfish approach to this would come from maybe self-driving cars and routing algorithms. That's like the central authority, like a lawyer from the previous example. However, they did prove that selfish driving only increased traffic by 33%, which is still pretty high, but with self-driving cars, we still won't have a utopia of no traffic. Accidents will be reduced for sure, which will help, but in terms of simple congestion, don't expect Los Angeles or New York to be traffic-free with self-driving cars.
Now, game theory does have applications in logic and computer science through a field called algorithmic game theory, or the study of ideal strategies for games. This can apply to large-scale networks, online advertising, computational auctions, and so on. Then within that, you have mechanism design, sometimes called inverse game theory, where instead of asking what kind of behavior will come from these set of rules, like ratting each other out from the police, you instead go in the other direction and ask what rules will give us the behaviors that we want. At my school, computer scientists and math majors were not required to, but had the option of taking an elective in game theory. Then at MIT, they offered game theory as a graduate level class within the economics department, but there's another game theory class with engineering applications within the electrical engineering and computer science department. So this is definitely something you can get into within multiple fields if this interests you. Now, one reason I did this video is because it was more fun to do and it went over a lot that's not taught to us in high school. But another reason was to illustrate the kind of math and problem solving out there that is not just solving the quadratic formula or doing synthetic division, but still involves rigorous work. I wanted to do more topics for this video and maybe I'll do a part two at some point, but due to time, I can only cover so much. But the book covers so many more topics in way more detail, such as networking, scheduling, randomness, and so on. And if you wanna buy it for yourself while supporting the channel, links are in the description down below. Otherwise, I'm gonna end that video here. If you enjoyed, please leave a like and subscribe. Don't forget to follow Major Prep on social media, and I'll see you all in the next video.